Dr. Eddy, let me come back to you. Uh, you know, we are talking about uh, uh, the, the, the the new world or that we are talking about moving from unipolar to a multipolar world. So now, and of course, we see that, that uh, the, 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 the dominance by the USA, uh, she quite mentioned uh, the dollar and other uh, policies uh, that when taken by, of course, uh, the US that seems to be dominating in terms of which is actually no longer the case. It affects uh, especially countries in the developed uh, can, uh, 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 nations. So uh, in the developed world, I beg your pardon. So the question is, what would uh, the change in global economy mean for Africa? And of course, we are looking at Africa engaging uh, with uh, other blocks like the BRICS. Uh, can this challenge the US uh, uh, dominance uh, in a global economy? And how can this position the African continent. The second question, uh, which uh, I, I will link to what uh, Lucy just said, uh, Dr. Eddy, is what are some of the internal obstacles, uh, internal obstacles uh, to Africa uh, position its, uh, positioning itself at uh, the global level, practically? Thank you, Clarice. I believe for the uh, first question, uh, the question should be more of, uh, since we're talking about, you know, Africa's, you know, uh, role. Uh, and I will say here, use the word of my uh, sister Lucy, uh, influence, right? Because this is what we are talking about in and here more uh, at uh, the uh, global level. The question whether Africa turns uh, and increases its uh, relationship with uh, the BRICS countries or with uh, the countries of the global south for reminding us or bringing us back to the uh, non-aligned uh, movement, for instance, or whether Africa improves its relation with uh, the global north, uh, we are talking about you know, North America or the European Union. And when I see improvement in here, it is uh, in the sense of, uh, again, uh, how this can trigger now not to improving uh, the living condition to day to day of uh, African uh, people. The most important thing for us is wherever you know what the continent turns, who holds the agency? And I think what we are all concerned with even here, as my brother Paseka said, is as we talk about Africa's role, is who drives the wheel. In 2000, I believe that you know what the former uh, Secretary General of UNESCO. Federico Mayo at the time, uh, prefaced you know, a, a document from the, the World Bank uh, saying that you know, what the problem or the question for Africa or the desire for the Africans is to start uh, driving uh, their own vehicle to state at that. Time. So that was the two, 1990 or if you want 2000, we are into 2023, 23 years after. Have we really push off for whoever was sitting in that driver's seat for Africa to be in there so that we can drive our own vehicle. And of course, you know, how we deal with our different partners we've been dealing with for uh, years till uh, uh, now. So I believe that, you know, the fundamental questions, Clarice, is not whether we displace one to replace with another. The question is, to what extent today, the African, country, uh, African countries, for instance, uh, are moving from uh, what we have called economically the periphery to be part uh, of uh, the center in that decision uh, making, whether it is at the political level, it is at the global political level with the United Nations, or at the uh, global economic level uh, with uh, the uh, uh, financial, international financial institutions. I think this is what, you know, is important. Listen, we are talking more and more of uh, China's, you know, growing influence is the real in Africa. Too. But more and more, we are also hearing about the of that giant Chinese And sometimes we think to talk about that, you know, what more often. What matters? To what extent those deals are, you know, what rural population, for instance. When we do hear that, you know, what in Cameroon, you have a far, I mean, what large areas of land devoted or conceded to Chinese, you know, what interests or Chinese, you know, what companies for the production of rice. The big question is, why is this that, you know, what the continent remain still what? food insecure. Therefore, that is my uh, my uh, transition to address uh, your second question. What are the internal obstacles? There are plenty of them. Number one, I just talked about you know, food insecurity. 
What drives and continue to drive immigration from Africa? What continues to drive the uh, exodus of this uh, talented African, you know, young people who actually are being courted by the rest of the world? As I said earlier, those statistics do not come from us. They do come from uh, uh, recognized you know, offices that are pinpoint that in a few years, Africa will be the continent of the future because that will be the receptacle of younger people, young, valid individuals who are capable of working. The question is, what drives these young people to cross the Mediterranean, to cross Africa, you know, uh, uh, trek, you know, in the Amazon forest, uh, or to uh, uh, negotiate a new business, uh, business corridors, new uh, migration corridors? The question is uh, the living and working conditions on the ground. So this is one of the obstacles. A second obstacle, therefore, living with that, I've been talking about that, relating to that, is the workers. Look at all these medical doctors that are trained by a, a, a African universities. The question is, why are they not staying? How are they being treated? What is the reward of this hard work that they have? What makes other places more attractive than where they are? Why is that, you know, where patriotism is uh, declining more and more among these young people? This is another obstacle. Because as we talked about development, as we talked about growth, as we talked about influence, those ones do not come from machines. Human beings actually engineer, implement that influence. It has to be some political leaders who are working. Because geopolitics, as I said, you know, were in one of the shows, uh, 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 in a, what, a few months or weeks, you know, before, as we talked about geopolitics, it's also language. It's what we say. It's where we put the values. When, for instance, I determine that, you know, well, my brother, if I determine that my brother Paseca is a rogue individual, that language itself means that the ways in which I'm going to treat brother Paseca will be determined by the ways in which uh, what I determine or I find him, right? If I say that he's my enemy, then my actions will be different. Rather, if I say that he is my brother of another country, but of the same continent, as a dark as I am, it also triggers another behavior. These are things that we have to see. Another big obstacle, that, uh, Clarice, that I see is the political instability that we have. I'm not looking at the Sahel even here to talk about the coup, but I'm looking at each of those African countries. You see, people are very keen on lambasting, attacking whenever there is a coup in Africa, and we should, because none of our documents, no African country, no African populations actually wanted to live in countries with dictatorship or with military rule that do not respect their rights. Nobody. And you can take the Afrobarometers, a uh, service from each country, that's clear. But the question is, if we are looking, as I told a friend, to be picky on the countries where there is a coup, why is that when we look at all the statistics today, it is clear that, you know, the African continent, you don't have more than 10 countries that are rated as free and fair. And we don't have military rules all over. Therefore, it is time for us also to turn, right, to the what we call the civilian regimes. Why is that autocracy is growing more and more? And we know the repercussions of this autocracy. It is taking away people's rights to speak, people's rights to assemble, workers' rights, women's rights, and all of those things are embedded into that. Another two obstacles, and then I'm going to stop in that, is, I already mentioned food insecurity, but Clarice, we want to talk about health and access to health. Here's another obstacle. Internally, Sister Viola was more concerned with the daily lives of the people who are actually who? They are producing, I mean, the uh, forces of production. Let's take West Africa. You have uh, two countries, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, by themselves, produce over 40% of the cocoa beans of the world, right? And we are talking about a billion or hundred billion of dollars, I believe, that this uh, 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 culture generates. Question is, why is this that the main producing uh, uh, forces of production, the farmers, either they work for themselves, 
either the worker for uh, large industrial cocoa farms or not, are living in poverty. And there has been years and years and years of countries trying to address that, but we're still in and there. Here's another obstacle, and I believe. And finally, the free movement of people. Sister Lucy mentioned that, and I want to reiterate that, and I uh, agree. As we talked more about, you know, about the free movement of goods, we have the impression that, you know, well, goods move more freely in between African countries than the people who produce those goods, meaning individuals, human beings, brothers and sisters. But civilizations grow because we move from one area to another. So I believe that even with uh, the advent of uh, regional passports and all of those things, still moving from one African country to another one remains very difficult. Trade between one African country and another one remains difficult. This is the reason why we should continue to empower the African continental free trade agreements to become a reality. So we see, if it is effective, it is going to be one of the largest, if not the largest, common markets. And Brother Basse talked about, you know, what the common currency. This is also something that, you know, the African countries very dedicatedly, we have resolute leaders should be looking into. At the end of the day, all of those things are not going to make the continents separated or uh, not dealing with other countries. On the contrary, it is going to increase the volume of our presence in the global world and global arena. So in a too short, uh, Clarice, I think that, you know, what is more important to resume, uh, summarize what I'm saying, uh, what is more important for us here in here to understand is not whether the African countries are now keen on a building relationship with the king, uh, with the uh, BRICS or other countries. It is more so of a, where do we, or to what extent, whatever relationship that you know we are building, lead to Africa increasing in influence, not only within the continent, but also in the global arena. And then in terms of, of uh, obstacles, uh, I think uh, we can look more at what is uh, inside that uh, creates uh, some sort of uh, instabilities and also this kind of a uh, discouragement that young people see, which leads them to uh, embark on uh, these uh, migration routes.